Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerSportsBetting.com. We're in the sports section on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, it's my belief that things change over time. They run in cycles, right? They do in life. They do in sports, right? Let's talk about sometimes when things change, right? Major leagues in the 40s, very staid league, um, you know, not a lot of aggression. Suddenly, here's a new dynamic, right? I don't want you to think 1947. I want you to think 1949, different year, right? Jackie Robinson, after starting at first base, moves to second base, starts bringing with him stuff they were doing in the Negro Leagues. So when Jackie gets on first base, on a hit, a single, a walk, Jackie turns the stolen base into a weapon. I don't mean by just stealing second base. I'm talking about by jumping up and down while on first base, threatening to steal second base, right? This is a new time in baseball, right? This decombobulated several pitchers. This is Ricky Henderson several generations early, right? So Jackie's there with attitude, jumping up and down on first base, threatening to steal second base. Everyone in the stadium sees him, in part because, of course, he's one of the few brothers out there change the game. Jackie Robinson not only leads the league in stolen bases in 1949, folks, he's your MVP, right? If you study Jackie Robinson, please study 1949. He changes the game literally. Well, let me just go further. So baseball gets back to big hits and big flies and stuff like that. Then in the early 60s, another Dodger, Jackie's organization, only a different coast. Murray Wills shows up. And Murray Wills is not just threatening to steal every time he's on base. Murray Wills is stealing almost every time he's on base. Right? Murray Wills blows away the single season stolen base record. Teams are so unprepared. <clears throat> that literally some teams, in an effort to slow down Murray Wills before games, water the base pass, right? They couldn't stop him. Catchers were unprepared to deal with this level of speed. So they literally started watering the base pass down to stop Murray Wills, right? Changed the game. Fast forward, in the 1980s, there was a time where you understood that if Ricky Henderson got on first base or if Vince Coleman got on first base, you understood they were going to try to steal second. Henderson was almost a clone of Jackie Robinson, right? Big lead off first jumping up and down, faking like he's going to run, <coughs> having teams literally deconstruct, right? Vince Coleman, you knew he was going to steal at least 90 bases every year. You knew that. If you were a St. Louis Cardinals fan, you understood what Whitey Ball was all about. Whitey Herzog, the manager manufactured runs, right? Games won on speed and defense. This is before the home run era. 
of the 21st century. This was during a stretch when no one hit 50 home runs, right? Understand, in the entire decade of the 1980s, no one hits 50 home runs. It was news in the 70s when George Foster eclipsed 50, I believe in like 77, then no one hit 50 again until Cecil Fielder, not Prince Fielder, but his father, Cecil Fielder, in 1991. So in that interim period, what you had were teams relying on spectacular defense. Again, St. Louis, Ozzie Smith, the Wizard of Oz, right? And manufactured runs. Guys getting on first base, stealing second, tagging and going to third on a uh, fly ball to right field, then scoring on a single. You had a totally different dynamic than you have now in baseball, right? Now in baseball, we're in a transition period where you don't have the Jackies, the Maurice, the Joe Morgans, right? The Lou Brocks. You don't have guys who are messing with pitchers' heads, stealing a lot, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing runs. What you have is an adjustment period going on from a power era. Let's talk boxing. This is really the era of flat foot boxing. Right? Um, you think of three sluggers who right now are ruling the roost to some degree. Right? Wishlin Povotnikov, champion. Janady Golovkin, champion. Sergei Kovalov, champion. And you just think, wow, what kind of style could beat these guys? Right? These guys seem to have, you know, decent foot speed. They track you down. They hit awfully hard. Who could possibly beat them? And what I want folks to realize is, in a different era, right, the 70s and 80s, these guys would have been regarded as flat-footed. A Ray Leonard would have been drooling to fight these guys, if you could equalize weight, right, drooling to fight these guys. After all, wasn't it Ray Leonard? who made the great Roberto Duran look incredibly flat-footed and slow in their rematch. So much so that Duran, who truly was great, revamped his style and gave himself more mobility later in the 1980s and resurrected his career after that Ray Leonard loss, right? I would argue that Duran in the chess match really gave Marvin Hagler and I'm talking about Prime Hagler, all he could handle, in part by making Hagler look flat-footed at times. Well, my point is simply, <coughs> just consider the fact that Timothy Bradley gets concussed early against Richland Provotnikov, early in the fight, by Bradley's own admission. We have a great source, the fighter himself. Right, gets beaten up and concussed early, then is able to move and survive for the rest of the fight and win. Right? That's the secret to beating these guys. Right? This is the era of flat footed fighters. In fact, it's a bit startling because even guys with foot speed. Think David Hay, right? Think Jean Pascal, right? Think the whole category of ambush fighter. Even the guys with foot speed are using that foot speed to be flat-footed. In other words, and forgive me, I got a really bad throat today. David Hay is fast. 
But David Hay uses that foot speed. He's sudden. In other words, you're relaxed in the ring. Suddenly, here's David Hay, and guess what? He's throwing haymakers, right? But the point is, when David Hay leaps inside, he's leaping inside on flat feet with power shots, right? That's the generation we're in, right? Guys get there. They're not there to throw lengthy combinations, they're there to throw power shots. The power is outsized. Excuse me. The power is outsized in this generation. You got a lot of guys who can take you out with one punch. Right? What's neglected is the ability to get up on your toes, to shoot a jab, to have the action be not episodic, but constant. To be able to circle around the ring while engaging in offense, right? That part of the game is missing somewhat. What Ray Leonard did intuitively, move around the ring, make guys look slow-footed, throw clever counters, then come in, throw combinations, be busy, but be busy on the move, right? Understand, Ray Leonard's not low volume. Ray Leonard's keeping you engaged, but Ray Leonard's moving around the ring. What Ray Leonard did intuitively, guys today can't do. So, returning to David Hay, you look at his fights, you'll be surprised how low volume he is. You want to see low volume? Look at the CompuBox numbers for his fight against Vladimir Klitschko. Let's talk about Vladimir Klitschko. The difference between Vladimir Klitschko and, let's say, Larry Holmes is that both guys had stiff jabs. I would argue Larry Holmes' jab's better than Vladimir Klitschko's jab. But there's a part of Holmes. You saw it in one of his most dangerous moments, the Ernie Shavers fight where he gets knocked down, right? Larry's on the canvas. That's the closest Larry came to being stopped. He's knocked down by Ernie Shavers, one of the hardest punchers I've ever seen. Larry gets up. Larry covers up. Then Larry starts dancing. Folks, it's on film. Larry starts dancing behind a jab. And even a Larry Holmes who's recovering from a knockdown moves infinitely better than Vladimir Klitschko ever has on his best day. Right? Vladimir Klitschko is flat-footed. Klitschko's a big guy. He's bigger than his opponents. He has skills. He's a boxer. He sticks a jab out. He has a construct, Emmanuel Stewart style, right? He hits you with the jab. He'll come in with the left hook. He has one of boxing's best punches, that straight right hand, right? That's Vladimir Klitschko. But like Lennox Lewis, who changed the game in the post-Larry Holmes era, right? Vladimir Klitschko is tethered to the canvas, Right? There's no bounce to his game. Right? That's the problem I have with Lennox Lewis. Flat-footed. Understand, before Lennox Lewis, a lot of heavyweights moved around the ring. A lot of heavyweights had, you know, the ability to dance. Lennox Lewis was your first supersized heavyweight in that era who didn't even pretend to dance. Right? That's not who Lennox Lewis was. Right? Lennox Lewis was basically an updated version of George Foreman. Right? Well, my point is simply this. The guys who can move, think Timothy Bradley, who beat Wishlin Provotnikov. Right? And Provotnikov, of course, just beat Mike Alvarado. <coughs> think a guy Bradley beat who to me, is one of boxing's more underrated champions. Miguel Vasquez. 
right? The guys who can move will give these flat-footed fighters problems. Floyd Mayweather seems to be fighting flat-footed fighter after flat-footed fighter, right? He showed some movement against Robert Guerrero. Once we understood Mayweather still had his legs, and I doubted it before the fight, right? He was able to look, uh, make Guerrero look like he was operating out of a cement box, right? Guerrero couldn't keep up with Mayweather's leg movement. Then Mayweather fights Canelo. Didn't Canelo look slow in that fight? Just food for thought. Didn't Canelo look like he didn't have a lot of ring coverage? He couldn't get around the ring in that fight. Didn't Canelo's low volume suddenly become a disqualification in the fight? In other words, once you realize that Canelo against stationary opponents is low volume, against a moving opponent, he was practically beaten. Couldn't do anything against Floyd Mayweather. So what I want folks to realize is you need to focus on the foot speed. I still maintain that Paulie Malinaji, who I picked to beat Adrian Broner, let an opportunity slip. He lost the fight officially by split decision, but as a big underdog, but he let an opportunity slip there because he could have won that fight. I want people to look at the replays of the fight. I believe there was an interpersonal dynamic there involving Pauli Malignaggi's ex-girlfriend and dating and pre-fight hype that had Malignaggi moving less than he should have early on. And as it was, Malignaggi went the distance against Broner. Understand the big difference between Broner and Floyd Mayweather is that Mayweather operates off the balls of his feet. He moves much better than Adrian Broner, even with the age gap, right? Mayweather moves much better than Adrian Broner. Broner's going to have to change his center of gravity and his stamina, his fight pattern, to be able to move a lot better than he does. Let's talk Jadady Golovkin against Curtis Stevens. To beat Golovkin, you're going to have to move around the ring. Right? Keep the flat-footed fighter resetting. Right? It, it takes a while. The reaction time between getting to a spot and throwing punches is shorter for guys operating off the balls of their feet than it is for flat-footed fighters. Now, Golovkin's a hunter, but he's a clever hunter, right? He doesn't just jump right in. He's trying to pressure you to death. While he's pursuing you, you have to be able to operate on the move off your back foot and win those rounds. In other words, while he's pursuing you, you should be winning rounds. In my opinion, that's not Curtis Stevens. Curtis Stevens is a guy who, quite frankly, is trying to fight exactly the kind of fight that Janady Golovkin fights. Take a look at Curtis Stevens against Andre Durrell, a mover. Right, Durrell wins that fight by a wide margin. Fight's a terrible fight. There's hardly any action in it because it's basically Durrell from a distance peppering Curtis Stevens with jabs and moving out of the way, right? Stevens can't fight on the balls of his feet. I like two bets in that fight. The first is one, the fight does not go the distance, right? I understand both guys have good chins. I don't see this fight going the distance. The other is if I had to pick a guy to win the fight, it would be Gennady Golovkin. He's better defensively. He hits harder than Curtis Stevens. So I like both of those bets. Rather than just one bet of Golovkin by KO, you want to hedge the play because understand, if Golovkin gets the KO, 
you win both parts of the bet. Right? You know, the point is, the fight's not going the distance, in my opinion, and Golovkin's going to win the fight. Right? Why would I want to have it be an all or nothing? If, and we've seen this before, Stevens gets battered, but somehow is able to hang up, to go the distance. Think Shannon Briggs against Vitaly Klitschko, right? Briggs is totally dominated, but somehow he takes inordinate punishment. Then at least you win the hedge. Golovkin to win the fight, right? And of course, if you have the prop, fight doesn't go the distance, or both guys by KO, right? If you have both guys by KO, hedge with Golovkin to win the fight, if Curtis Stevens gets lucky, then that part of the hedge works, right? In my opinion, Stevens can only win the fight by KO, right? So, I don't expect this fight to go the distance. <coughs> I think this fight is going to be missing. A guy who can fight on the balls of his feet and can move around the ring. What you're going to have is the kind of condensed action that you had in the Golovkin Matthew Macklin fight. Expect fireworks. Just don't expect them to last too long. Somebody is getting knocked out. I suspect it's going to be Curtis Stevens, but I'm going to hedge the play in a way. Where if Stevens gets lucky, then I'm protected. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com and understand what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that there's a huge opportunity for the Miguel Vasquez's of the world. As I've said in an earlier video, I think Miguel Vasquez beats Adrian Broner. I think the public right now is overrating flat-footed fighters. Understand the guy who died against Sergei Kovalov was giving Kovalov a competitive fight until the fateful round. Right? These guys, these flat-footed knockout punchers look dominant when they close the show early. But understand, they can look limited. When they meet a guy who can fight on the move, on their back foot, behind a jab. Right? You can't hurt what you can't find. We're in a Joe Lewis era. Right? He can run, but he can't hide. That's what Lewis said before he fought Billy Codd. Understand, in my opinion, Joe Lewis would look extremely slow against Muhammad Ali. Let me hear from you. Thanks for stopping by.